everybody. Welcome to the Ron Line Report. We got a guy on today that's been on the Ron Line Report a few times before, you know, commentating on shows and previews for contests, wrap ups. He's been my partner in crime on some coverages, but we don't know much about the man himself. That's about to change, everybody. As today, the Ron Line Report talks to Giles Tiger Thomas, all the way from the UK. Thanks for joining Hello. us. Hey, Ron. So, uh, everyone has. You know, I get contacted a lot of times by people who want to know how to break into the industry. How did you get into the industry? Everybody's got a completely different story. I found that there is no uh, set formula for, quote, unquote, breaking into the industry, whether it be the supplement side of it, the media side, whatever. So how did this all start for you? First of all, where did you actually get interested in this whole industry and bodybuilding and all that in the first place? I started uh, weight training when I was 13, um, and then in 1990, I picked up issue 90, uh, 96 of Muscle Mag and I picked up um, a copy of Flex. So I started reading the magazines. Instantly, it kind of captured my imagination. It kind of really, it's something I kind of really liked. I thought it was pretty cool because uh, I was into the artwork. I know I've mentioned the art, the comic artist Simon Bisley before, but um, yeah, it kind of all came at a, at a at a very similar time where you know, the whole, uh, the muscular comic um, characters and bodybuilding. Because and, before that, I was kind of a bit obsessed with um, like horror films like yourself. Hmm. I was big into like Freddy Krueger and I had a huge bedroom in this because uh, I grew up in a 13th century uh, pub. Oh. This be yeah, beautiful old building, Wales, the oldest uh, pub in town. And it was a big creepy old house really. And uh, so it was. I kind of had this huge bedroom with slopey floors, and it was covered in like Freddy memorabilia. So my dad was pretty worried. About, my dad was pretty worried about me. So of course, I, I, I replaced all the wall space within a few months of just basically pictures of half naked men. So he was still worried about you, but for a different reason now. Yeah. He was worried for a different reason. Yeah, and then. Um, he said, son, have I got anything to worry about you? And I went, um, no, just, you know, I think it's pretty cool. And uh, so I went and got a big couple of posters for both Helena Christensen from the local clothes shop and uh, put those up just to keep him happy. <laughs> so who, who were the guys that you looked up to when you first started looking in the magazines, the physiques that inspired uh, you? Oh, it was Sean Ray. Sean Ray, 100%. Um, I mean, this was the 1990, so that was the year he won the Arnold Classic. You know, he got third at the Olympia. I really like Lee Brad and Barry DeMay. Um, uh, I like Bob Chick's physique. I liked Eddie Robinson, um, and, and obviously the, the year after was when kind of Ronnie and Kevin were kind of coming through the, you know, you know, uh, Kevin won the nationals in 91 yep. and, uh, I just, you know, and I was hooked by this point, I was absolutely hooked. So I started, um, I started weight training in my bedroom. Um, I had these 10 pound weeder dumbbells. Uh, which my sister had to carry for me because I wasn't strong enough to carry it. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, and I used, to, I used to train every night doing, doing the little routine and stuff. And then I joined like a local multi-gym at the, one of the local schools. And uh, yeah, and by the time I was like 15, I was absolutely obsessed, you know. So, you know, I got into the industry side of it 21. That was pretty young, I thought. But <clears> you were even younger than that. I know you were only 18. So how did that happen? Yeah, I was 18 because I, I, I actually um, started photographing shows around 92, so I was about 15, 16. Wow. And I've actually, got, I've, actually got, I've actually got a picture above my desk here of a photo I took in. Can I, can I get it down? I don't know, can you? <laughs> okay, yeah. okay. okay, now this, this photograph, can you see it okay? Uh, yeah, there you go. It's a little shiny because ah. it's behind glass, but I can see it's a photograph of some, some contest or other. That was the 1993 British Grand Prix. Wow. Now, if you see, there's Kevin Lebrone, Flex Wheeler, um, Charles, Charles Claremont, who won that show. Yeah. Remember, he got seventh in the Olympia that year, and um, he sharpened up for the Grand Prix Tour, and he beat Flex Wheeler, who'd won the Arnold, who got second the Olympia, and he kind of never replicated that kind of success again. But um, if you look, actually, this was when Kevin Lebrone was announced third. Hmm. And you can see Kevin's going, ah! I think he Looks like he's a little bit uh, shocked. Yeah, he doesn't look happy, but he, um, that, that was the year he ripped the peck. And, uh, I mean, that was a photo I took when I was 17. Wow. And I, and I actually printed it uh, two years later when I went to uh, uh, photography college. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, so I just started photographing the magazine, uh, photographing sort of bodybuilding shows. And I kind of, you know, I used to go over with my camera. And then when I was 18, um, it was actually 1994. And going back to Kevin Lavrone, I was at the British Grand Prix, and that was a year that Dorian, uh, Dorian and Kevin were very, very close. 
I think they um, they both came in exactly the same body weight. I think it was something like Peter McGough will know this. It was something like two hundred and forty nine pounds. Mm. It, it was very close. But anyway, after the show, I was sat with um, I was sat with Kevin at the hotel at the um, the next morning, the where all the all the athletes used to stay, and I was just kind of uh, hanging out with him, talking, and I had this picture I took of. Um, Dorian Yates uh, at a guest posing in early 93 before he ripped his bicep. Yeah. Uh, it was a black and white picture and it was a really kind of um, art arty kind of, uh, and, I, and I had it and uh, and he says, hey, he says, you take good photos. He says, and you, you seem to know a lot about the sport. And uh, he says, why don't, why don't you write for the magazines? And then Peter, Peter McGough walked past and he says, well, Peter, Peter, he says, this guy should have your job. He says, <laughs> and I just, and Peter just like burst out laughing, of course, you know, I mean, the guy's a legend, you know, there's this yeah. young spotty kid, you know, in his, uh, in his lumberjack shirt and his baggies and his bum bag, you know, oh, funny, funny, pack, funny, yeah, pack. Yeah, yeah. funny and um, yeah, so he said, he says, look, man, he says, you know, you've got passion, you've got knowledge, he says, you should really put that to use. And I was like, do you really think so? And he said, yeah, he says, yeah, so. So yeah, so that kind of gave me a little bit of um, self-belief that I could do, you know, write and photograph for magazines. So I was, uh, there was, there was a local, there was a photographer, a NABA photographer who trained at my gym in Hereford, a guy called Malcolm Wyatt. Now he'd been the editor of um, Health and Strength and all these kind of different British magazines over the years. And I kind of approached him and I showed him a photo and I said, what do you think? He says, oh yeah, you know, give me a few tips. And I said, look, I'd really wa I really want to get involved in the magazine industry. I really want to start, you know, I feel like I've got something I could, you know, I could offer. Because uh, there was maybe maybe three, four British magazines at the time. Yeah. So he, he reached out to all the editors. Um, there was a guy called Dave McInerney who ran the UK Muscle Mag. And then we had um, Maxine Noring Gray from Bodybuilding Monthly, all these kind of British magazines. And he contacted each one of them. And he said, look, there's this young kid. He says, just, just give him a chance. Um, I think, you know, I'll, I'll vouch for him. You know, he's a good kid. Yep. He said, just just, um, just hear him out. So I started sending my work in. So, but what I did, I didn't want anyone to know my age. So I got, <laughs> no, because yeah. I thought they would be a bit, they wouldn't give me a chance. So I got this beautiful, like this woven sort of uh, print um, writing paper. I got a, I got a, uh, like a logo designed and I ca called myself Giles Thomas Specialist Physique Photography and Illustration. Because you know, I do drawings and cartoons and stuff like that, right. and uh, so I had like a, I got myself a pager, and you know it's sort of, it's kind of looked very official and very professional. So I started sending in samples of my work, and they all they, they every single one got printed. Wow! Yeah, and um, and I did some studio photography of a, uh, a Welsh bodybuilder called Tony Barnbrook. I'm actually going to stay. Me and Rosie are going to stay with him in December because he competes this year. We're going to see Five Finger Death Punch with him. And, um, what was his name? Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, and then it was a funny story. It was in 1996. It was at one of the British shows, uh, Nava Britain. And uh, one of the editors, because I, I said I was going to I was gonna meet one of the editors there who I'd been working for for nearly a year. So I, went, I came down the front, this guy, and he, I had my press pass on with my name on. He went, oh, he says, uh, do you work for Giles? And I says, no, I am Giles. And he went, <laughs> he went, Oh, and I said, I know what you're thinking. I think you're thinking I'm young, aren't you? And he says, yeah. I said, how old are you? And I said, I'm 19. And he went, oh. And I said, yeah, well, that face tells me everything I need to know. I said, would you have given me a chance if you'd have known my age beforehand? And he went, no, probably not, no. Mm. I said, are you, happy, are you happy with my work? And he went, yeah, very work, very happy. And I went, well, there you go. And then I, <laughs> I, just, picked, I just turned around and carried on photographing. Yeah. So, so 90s, 90s bodybuilding was actually, I, I believe, a great time for UK. You had Mr. Olympia, you know, the only, the only UK uh, Mr. Olympia we, that there's ever been was Dorian Yates all throughout the most, through a large part of the 90s. You had Charles Claremont, uh, J.D. Duwadu. Who were some other guys that were really big time in the 90s when you were just getting into all this? Are you mean British athletes? British athletes, yeah. Well, you, had, you had Ian Harrison. Um... You had Ian Harrison. Um, oh, there was loads, wasn't there? There was, there was guys coming through later. Guys like Eddie Abu. There was a lot of good. Um, there was a guy, there was a group of guys called the Muscle Works Boys. There was a very famous gym in London that seemed to produce. Like you go to the British Championships, and this was when they didn't have supers, and like five of the top six heavyweights would all be the same guys from the same gym. Mm. And uh, they were just, it was like a monster factory, this place. It was like kind of like the, it was kind of like the, uh, the oxygen, 
of UK. You know, it just produced. You could tell. You could tell which guys were because they were just awesome. But um, yeah, we had obviously Dorian was um, Dorian kind of gave everyone a sense of like hope, and I think um, because up till then European bodybuilders are kind of not. I, I don't know whether the quality wasn't there, but he certainly created a surge of quantity and quality in the UK that um, and gave people a sense of hope that they could um, break it through and it, you know was possible which is now paved for the way for people like uh, Flex Lewis and uh, you know and athletes like that and um, and even European athletes as well so you know I think when you say paved the way I think it seemed to me one big aspect that Dorian uh, did achieve that was that before that, everyone felt like they had to go out to Los Angeles, Venice Beach, uh, you know, go knock on Joe Weider's door. And, you know, they felt like that was the only key to success in the business, even as a competitor. But Dorian came along, and this is a guy that just stayed, laid low all year, trained hard in this little crappy, well, I hate to call it crappy, you know, a little dingy gym. Crappy, crappy. Gym. <laughs> it did smell pretty bad. A little gym in Birmingham, and he keep pop up once a year and blow everybody away and then go back into hiding. It was so, fun. I mean, the thing, is, the, the thing with, uh, with Dorian was, I mean, I think he was very lucky in his timing, not just with when he came along, but the people around him. He had, don't forget, he had Kevin Horton and Peter McGough mm. to really kind of build up this mystique. They kind of saw an opportunity, like, right, here's a guy no one knows anything about, and we can spin this to create this almost like mythological creature, which is what they did because, I mean, you know, I, I filmed, I photographed you and filmed you at uh, Temple Gym, you know, when you trained with Dorian, you know, that was your, I, was, I think it was your, was that your, 2010, was that your first time there? Only time there, yeah. Yeah, when you trained, when you trained legs with Dorian and, um, yeah, and, yeah, it was, um, but it was kind of, um, he kind of went against the grain and he kind of rewrote the book on, there isn't only one route to success. And it, I think Dorian proved that the best kind of genetics aren't always the physical genetic, it's the mental genetics. I mean, Dorian's mind, I think, was, it's like Ronnie's, it was like almost stronger than his body was. Mm. Um, you know, it, it, it ju he just had this focus and this kind of determination. I mean, I think, I mean, people say Dorian had, I don't think he had bad genetics, but if you compared him to someone like the Flex Wheelers or the Kevin Lavrones, you know, he was, he was inferior. I mean, you could have, you could, no way could you have seen him at his early years and thought that guy's going to win six Olympias easy. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not saying easy, but right, right, right. he won six Olympias. Yeah. But um, I think the thing with Dorian is on another note is that um, the, I think one of the reasons Dorian was so good is because his physique always looked its best in the compulsory poses. If you think about every compulsory pose, Dorian's physique came together in those poses. Yeah. The ab and thigh, the rear lap spread, the side tricep. I mean, it's, you know, whereas say Flex Wheeler would look good or Lee LeBrard would look good in all the aesthetic poses or the, you know, the kneeling poses, you know, that's not what you're judged on. Right. So, um, anyway, sorry. Go on. <laughs> do, do you have any cool Dorian stories of your own to share with us? Uh, not ones I could repeat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, moving on, moving on. Yeah, no, Dorian's cool, Dorian's cool. So, you know, you, you start off as a photographer, you did that for a while. Uh, how did you get into, you know, I, I, I see you just, you told me before we started, a, a website I used to actually post on every once in a while called UK Muscle. I didn't realize that you were the one that, that started that website. Yeah, it was around, because um, it was around about 99, because um, I started getting involved in the supplement industry. Um, and I kind of, um, after I left that first job with Metrex and Muscle News, a British newspaper, which was very much like Peter McGough's Pumping Press, it kind of carried on um, in that kind of style. Um, I, um, I, I kind of moved away from the magazine thing for a couple of years. I kind of, um, I didn't like the way that sometimes they presented my work. They would use the wrong photos and I didn't like the layouts. And it's uh, so, I kind of, um, at the end of 2001, I thought I want something that's my own. I want something I can have retained full control of. So I had an idea for a, a, like a website that is very much like the MD website. It was uh, like an online magazine. There was a lot of content. I mean, we didn't have video back then, but I had a forum with different categories. I had a natural category and women's and, and, and my one was kind of like, you know, as you'd imagine, it was uh, news and updates and shows and gossip and, and just a, just a platform for people to meet and, um, and kind of, kind of come together. So in May 2002, I launched it um, with my own funds and, you know, limited budget. And um, I think by 2004, it was probably 
I don't know whether in terms of members, I had about 11,000 members, which wasn't bad. But in terms of actual traffic and the quality of the members and the people that posted and the fact it was used as a source of kind of news and uh, I think it became, I would I would certainly think it became probably the one of the most uh, enjoyable and most interesting websites. And there was no, I didn't have any sponsors that could influence any of my um my editorial and I kind of didn't stand for any nonsense I was quite a harsh moderator <laughs> I, I didn't care if someone was um, Mr. Whatever I didn't care if they we all played by the same rules yeah. and uh, if anyone was being disrespectful or was, was being a bit egotistical or stuff I would I would give them a warning and then pff, they were gone but uh, <laughs> yeah it was quite ruthless really so it's probably why probably why uh, Steve's never asked me to be a moderator on MD because I think I'd buy everyone <laughs> Boy, now, sometimes we need to really uh, drop the hammer down on the nonsense. But uh, so, whatever happened to UKMuscle.com? UK Muscle, a uh, bit of a long story, but um, I had a few legal issues with a uh, with a business partner that um, I actually won. I actually won, but um, it shut the site down for um, a year or two, and then trying to relaunch it, it kind of never really picked up the kind of momentum that I needed to get it back to to kind of get it to not just where it was before, but beyond. Um, and by that point, I was um, I was kind of back in with a magazine thing because in 2008 I started posting on on MD. I joined MD forum in 2008, wow. and I was yeah, and I was kind of um, I was kind of wanting to go back into the the whole magazine thing. I missed I really missed it. I missed doing my photography. I missed doing the interviews and the articles. So I started working for a European magazine called uh, Body Fitness, uh, a Spanish based magazine, and they had a UK edition. And uh, I started off just doing like a gossip column, which were, they only wanted to be two pages. And within, I think, four or five issues, I was up to nine pages. It, wow. <laughs> and, it, and it got more ridiculous as it went on. Sure because, did. Yeah, because the, the letters that were coming in, which were printed in the magazine, they were like, we like the funny stuff, we like the silly stuff. So in the end, it was like maybe 30% fact and news. And the rest was just, it was just silliness. But people loved it, you know? But, in, but, in, but also... They managed to get one member of staff because they had writers, photographers, gossip columns, um, and everything. And I could do everything because I could do all the writing. I used to do photo shoots. I used to do, and I, I, I was probably producing maybe like yourself, very prolific in that I could produce a lot of content. Yeah. So I was, so they thought, well, this guy's reliable. He makes the deadline. We know we're going to have more than enough content to choose from. So I did the photography, the writing, the interviews. And in the end, I was even working with the design guy to do the design guy to do the layouts. So I just, I like to kind of, I'm quite a perfectionist. I like like things how I like to have the right photos, right photo choice, and and articles. And um, yeah, and then in 2010. And also from that magazine, I was posting my articles on the MD forum. And then in 2010, I got a message from, um, you know, your boss, Steve Blackman, our, our good friend. Yeah. And uh, he says, Giles, you know, would you like to uh, do a, uh, a European news column? And I says, perhaps. I mean, I was buzzing. I got the message. I was absolutely thrilled. I remember, I remember celebrating that night, you know, and I said, Steve, I'd, I'd absolutely love to. So, um, yeah, so then in 2010, I had a column in MD, um, which ran, as you know, for nearly four years, which, as you know, in this industry, that's a long time. That's long. Was it Euro, Euro muscle, right? Uh, Euro muscle scene. Euro muscle scene. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you had a few people in there. Who are some of the discoveries that came out of that i remember well you can rattle them off better than i know rosie was one of them but who are some of the other ones there some well um oh, well yeah. I it's it's yes it was funny when um when steve um put up put up put the post he says welcome giles thomas to the md team he said this is the man that discovered zach khan yeah. and i got so much shit for that you know <laughs> because like zach had been around years and i never actually i mean the thing is to, to Steve, I was probably the one that alerted people like to Zach Khan because I messaged uh, Steve and um, I think it was uh, one of the, the Romano it was, I, I messaged him when he was uh, back in the day, yeah. you know, and all the different uh, websites and magazines. And I said, look, this guy's, you know, he's fucking massive. He's, you know, he's got personality. He's got, so he's got something, he's got potential. Yeah. And um, so, so yeah, I got a lot, a lot of crap for that saying, you didn't discover Zach Khan. He's been around <laughs> for years and how dare you? And I was like, guys, I'm not, I'm not claiming this. I've never, ever said that. Yeah. But um, in terms of other people, there was guys like Sami Al-Haddad who were just amateurs at the time. Yep. 
Um, and we had people like, you know, like William Bonnack at back end of 2010, yeah. I was promoting him. And then I put him in, I think another two times when he got his pro card at the Juliet Bergman classic in, um, cause he, he only got thick, I think third at the Arnold amateur that year, 2011. Mm. And then I think after the Arnold amateur, he got, cause he was quite thick wasted then. Right. Um, and then somehow he managed to bring his waist in and put all this size on which was completely changed physique. And then he became a 212, as you know, as in, in 2012. Um, yeah, so I started promoting him and kind of pushing guys like that. And guys like that, Alexei Shabunya, you know, the, the Russian guy, um, even though that's not Europe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there was the, and I, I always liked the opportunity to be able to, because I think once you, you've been in the sport long enough, you develop a kind of an instinct of what constitutes could be a, what could be a future champion. Yeah. Um, you know, and then on the other side of that, I can, uh, me and Pete McGough spoke about this, how um, I totally missed the Flex Lewis thing. I mean, I did not see that, co- I did not see that coming at all. Yeah. I, I, even when he was a junior, I think he was, it was a bit of a, bit of a bad run of juniors that couple of years. And I was just like, I don't, I was taking Neil Hill and he says, no, I'm telling you, this kid has got it. He's going to go all the way to the top. I said, I just don't see it. But I'd never, <laughs> but I'd never actually met Flex at this point. Yeah. So. And then I met him and then I kind of got it. And that's when I realized that there's more to just analyzing someone's potential from just their physique. It's their attitude. It's the, it's their drive. And you know, you can, you can pick up on that. I think within minutes of meeting someone, whether someone's really got it up here, you know, like that kind of like that Dorian attitude, that mentality of like, and you think shit, nothing is going to stop this kid. Whereas um, on the flip side of that, I'm sure we both have met plenty of, Oh. Guys who physically had everything they could possibly have ever needed, but you talk to them for a little bit and you realize they just don't seem to have their shit together. Mm. You, know, you can tell they're not that driven. They're not that serious. Yeah. And, uh, to me, that that's kind of one of the harder things about doing what we do is we get to see these people we know could have been amazing, but they're just you know they're not going to be unless somebody comes in and does like a personality transfer in their brain or something. Or they, or they just have attitudes that it's it's all about gear. It's like, oh, I, I'm just not on the right stack. That's the only reason I've not won the Mr. Olympia by now. And you're just like, oh, God. Or, or they turn up and they've got, they, they have, I'm not being funny, or, they have, or it's the people they surround themselves with. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, Neil, uh, Flex Lewis had Neil Hill from day one. Right. And, you know, and they're still, they're still sort of, their bond is strong. You know, they trust each other. They love each other, those guys, you know, and they 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 got each other's backs and, you know, and I think that's very important, you know, that kind of stability, that kind of support when things maybe aren't going so well. You've got that person to kind of keep that belief in you. So here's one thing I want to ask you as a journalist to journalist. You know, we develop relationships, friendships with a lot of these guys over the years. But our job is, as an extreme example would be Sean Ray, someone who gets a lot of shit for giving his honest critique and saying it like it is and not sugarcoating things. Have you had you know, multiple occasions where you've had to be critical of somebody you're, you're pretty good friends with and they've gotten upset with you over it? Yeah, yeah, a lot actually. And I, in fact, more so even recently because I think getting together with Rosie, she's, she's very, um, like with, with her clients, with people around her, she's a very brutally honest person. She likes people to be brutally honest with her. And I've kind of, it's kind of rubbed off on me a bit now because I always, I think a few years ago, people would come to me and say, oh, I want your feedback. I want your opinion on, you saw me at the show. And I'll say, okay, well, firstly, you've got two choices. You can, you can, you can ask me what you want to hear, or you can ask me what I think. But, and then I give them that decision. And even when you do that, if you tell them something they don't like, they, they will still um, throw their toys out the pram. They will, unfortunately. But thing is, this sport is a sport about progression. It's not you're not you're not getting personal. And thing is, I'll always put a positive spin on something. I'll just say, "Oh my God, if you could just do this and da da da," and maybe even give an advice on how to do it. Yeah. I'll be honest. Most most I mean, like, um, see, like after the Olympia, uh, this Olympia, um, straight away, I'd flex Lewis messaging me, and he says, "Giles, I'm going to come to you." He says, "Because you're not going to give me bullshit." You're going to tell me straight. And I told him straight what I thought. And, you know, and I thought, I thought you're a bit flat. And then he says, yeah, I had some stomach issues, blah, blah, blah. And it's, um, now, see, 
is that a coincidence that someone like that is the best at what he does in his, you know, his category? Whereas someone will come to you and then I think sometimes they just expect you to blow smoke up their ass. Right. And I'm like, look, if you want me to tell you how amazing you are, yeah, you're amazing. But if you want to move up and you want to get better, then maybe, you know, you know, oh, you had a bit of stomach in that last contest. Or maybe you need to watch the waistline or sort of um, maybe get a bit harder or maybe you're coming in too flat. Or, you know, the thing is, I think it's intent because whatever I say, if some, I'll always want an athlete to do well. Yeah. It will always come down to I want the best for them. Right. Never cut somebody down or, you know, I mean, I, I just I find people like that very strange. I used to read some show reports in the UK and, so, and I think, oh, my God, they're just being cruel. They're just, just they're taking the piss out of people. And I just think, come on, you know, it's like, you know, you and I have competed. It's like, and you want people to give you, you know, honest critique. But, um, yeah, I had I, one funny story. I want to mention the guy's name. It was, um, this was, this was quite a few years ago, uh, at least 15 years ago. And this guy came up to me after the judging and he says, Giles, how do you think I've done? And I said, well, I says, judging by the call outs, um, I think they, they've, I, said, I didn't see me. I said, yeah. they've got you in third. I can tell the way they're moving them around. I says, they've got you in third. Like when uh, Steve said to us, with the, the Olympia, he says, they've got Dexter in fourth. I can see the way they're moving. And I didn't even see that. Yeah. So anyway, I said, yeah, I've got, they've got you in third. He says, well, where do you have me? I says, well, probably third. I said, I think that's fair. And he went, he just jumped up. He went, you went, fuck off. And do you know what? These words have stayed with me. The exact words. He says, all my mates said I've won it. And I, I said, oh, well, if your mate said they won it, if you've won it, then, you know, you know, game over, job done. Yeah. Um, and where do you think you placed? Uh, third, uh, fourth, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, anyway. So, yeah, but I think you know what it's like with, um, I think sometimes the, the good athletes really do want to hear critique or they want to hear how they, it's not about critiquing them. It's about how they can be better. It's how they can do better. It's how they could beat the guy that maybe did beat them, or girl, or whatever. Well, you know, uh, I, I think the real the people with the real champion mindsets are the ones that are never satisfied, and they always want to improve and be better. Whereas the people that never quite make it are the ones that think they're perfect as as they are. Just everybody hasn't recognized it yet for whatever reason. And I just want to yeah. tell a quick story because the New England is coming up. It's a regional show we have in Boston, and I remember Jose, Jose Raymond usually judges it. I don't know if he will this time. But I remember a couple of years ago, this might have been two, three, four years ago, uh, <clears throat> the judge, and after the judging, you know, there's only a couple places to eat in the area. So one of the competitors comes up to him, a super heavyweight, I believe he was, says, so what do you think? And all he wanted Jose to tell him was, you're awesome, you're going to win the whole show. <laughs> yeah. So Jose was like, eh, Jose can't lie to people. He's like me. He's just brutally yeah. honest, and whether it's uh, to our detriment or not. Jose's like, well... Well, because it was, it was pretty clear he was going to win the Supers because it was a weak class. But he's like, what do you think about the overall? And Jose's like, well, light heavy looks pretty good. And this guy got irate. No. And he said, that guy, he goes, well, if that guy wins, I'm never going to, I don't know why I bother training my fucking legs. He's got legs like toothpicks. And I was like, you know, I'm sitting there like, eavesdropping like crazy three feet away. And I almost ran, I almost piped up and said, that guy has beautiful shape, tiny waist. He's proportionate. You have... A blocky midsection. Your waist is like 50 inches around. You have shot up arms, lumps and bumps everywhere. He's got a beautiful physique. Your physique, not remotely beautiful. But I, I shut up. But yeah, we've both been there. I, I, I want to move on because no, go I ahead. think. Go ahead. I think the thing is, I say, most people don't actually know what constitutes a good physique, a contest winning physique. Um, like you'll always see people say, uh, oh, that shouldn't have, that was a disgraceful judging. And it's like, well, yeah, but if you actually take all uh, attributes of a physique into account, you know, that person that won did deserve to win. So anyway, my final say. Uh, well, I want to get right into the supplement side because I've never worked in the supplement industry you know, really in depth at all. I've done little bits of writing and stuff for them, but you have actually been mm -hmm. a player in a, in a couple of very large companies, and you're about to launch your own supplement line. So, give me the, the brief history of Tiger Thomas's supplement industry experience. <laughs> well, the, the main reason I got involved in the supplement industry was because in the UK, in the kind of uh, 95 to like 99, the magazines were small, but there was work, you know, but it wasn't really enough to sustain uh, an actual living. 
So I was kind of wanting to get out of my town in Wales, like Flex Lewis was, you know, and I wanted to really kind of just get out and sort of move up. And, but I, I wanted, I, I loved the magazine work. I loved doing it. So uh, I was working for a British magazine called Muscle News. It was a big, like I said, that newspaper. And um, the, they were owned by the UK distributor of Metrex that Dorian was a partner in. It was based in, uh, well, London, Middlesex. So they said, I said, is there any jobs going? I said, because I really want to, you know, I want to, I want to stay and I want to be able to sustain my, my magazine habit, <laughs> you know, yeah. I want to feed, I want to feed my addiction. Right. So he said to me, he says, well, look, yeah, he's actually, there's a, there's a job. He says, running the, um, the distribution for the UK metrics. He says, we're going to have a store. He says, and we're going to have, and I was 23. And he said, we're going to, you know, we, he says, and we'll, there'll be bits of magazines, but on the weekend we can do all the magazine work. We'll go off doing shoots and covering to shows. He says, and you've got a, a full-time job there and you can kind of work on that at the same time. I was like, yeah. So I went down and met him and Dorian. And uh, so I, I started working there and it, it worked perfectly because I used to do a lot of photo sales as well. I used to get my photos blown up and I get them printed up and then contact the competitors. And it, it was, it was make, I was making decent money at it. So, yeah, so that got me involved in the supplement industry, um, learning and obviously de dealing with all the UK clients. But that was Metrix. That was a distributor. It wasn't a manufacturer. Okay. Um, and then in 2000, I moved up to uh, Newcastle to work for a guy called John Citrone. I do, you know John Citrone? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, he competed with Arnold. He's a, he's a British bodybuilding legend. I mean, he's huge. He, won, he was competing for 50 years. Yeah, he was winning for 50 years. Yeah, he was. I mean, I think he looked his all time best when he was like 58, 59. I was at the show. This was in Thessaloniki. I mean, the guy was just, he took like a 20 year layoff of competing, came back, and he was even better. It was, I mean, yeah. just, he was a strong man. He was uh, like, he used to do the, the Franco Colombo blowing up the hot water bottles and all these strength acts. And yeah. he, he, was, but he was breaking bench press records in his shed when he was 17. He was like 150 pounds and he was benching, you know, by himself over, over 400 pounds. And wow. I mean, the guy. He was he had tendons like steel. So uh, I trained with him for nearly two years as well. So and he, and he taught me about true conditioning. So when I did my first show, I made uh, you know people were saying you shredded at six weeks. I'm like, no, I'm nowhere near shredded yet. So um, anyway, so yeah, I went to work for him, and he would started a company called uh, Peak Body, a uh, British supplement company, and it was um, I was kind of brought in to really kind of get custom and stuff like that because I, I said to him, I said, give me a car, give me a phone, and I'll see you in two weeks. And he get, he did that, and I disappeared for two weeks, and I came back, and I came back with a with a net with a UK network of uh, distributors that kind of all said, yeah, okay. Um, so he was like, well, okay. I said, right, next we need overseas customers. Um, and by year three, I think I've got us into like twenty eight different countries. Wow. Australia, Qatar. I mean, uh, and every country is different. But um, about three months in, I said, John, I said, I know I'm here for sales and marketing. I said, but I really got a good idea for a product. And he went, well, we're not really looking for product development. You know, we've got the other lad for that and the other guys for that. And so I said, well, you know, just I've got this idea for this energy drink. And it's going to be like a uh, plastic bottle and it's going to have powder in. And uh, I've got a basic formula. I said, maybe we can sit down and work something out. And he says, nah, people want protein. I says, no, I think I think this pre-workout thing is going to, going to, going to catch on. Huh. And he, he went, pre-workouts? He says, no, nah, it won't catch on. <laughs> so, oh, boy. So this was, yeah, this was in 2000. This was 17 years ago. So we put like a formula together and the product just exploded. I mean, it just, it's the turnover snowballed. I mean, I think uh, we, we went, I won't say the figures, but it was from there to there, which enabled us to kind of develop more products. So of course. What was it called? It was called Rocket Fuel. Rocket Fuel. I like it. Yeah, no, but we um we didn't register the name, and we got cut, taken to court by this big uh, food company that had the, the granulated coffee that saw we hadn't registered it as a caffeinated drink. Yeah. So they uh, even though we had the name for we changed it to caffeine kick anyway. But it it's still it's funny. I still see it in gyms around the country now. You know, around, around the UK, and it's I still get like a little buzz when I say. Well, sorry, pardon the pun, <laughs> but um I still get a little kick when I see it everywhere. Oh, pardon the pun again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um. Yeah, so that was, um, yeah, and obviously in two, that was in 2000 to 2004, and obviously 2002 I started UK Muscle as like a, my own kind of, uh, my own project, and I used to sell products on there as well, and um, yeah, it was, uh, it was good, and then obviously had a, a couple of not so great experiences which kind of put me off the supplement industry, and then in 2014, um, funny enough, I was at the, sorry, 2012, I was at the Arnold Europe. And um, 
that was where Ronnie launched his RCSS line. That was a first. They only had the Resurrect and the Maya Blitz, and they launched there. And uh, I was saying to my friend, you know, Kevin Horton, <clears throat> I said, because um, a friend of mine at the time, he'd set up his own UK company, and he was doing incredibly well. He actually sold it last year for 20 million. Wow. And, uh, yeah, he's, yeah he's, he's great. He's doing really, he's so proud of him. Yeah, and... Um, and I said, uh, yeah, I, I feel like I've got unfinished business in the supplement industry. I said, I, I think I want to get back involved. And he, and he said to me, he said, look, there's only one person I'd feel comfortable recommending. He said, that's a guy called Brendan Ahern. Mm. He said, he partners with Ron. He's only a young kid. He said he was one of the, the original executives at BSN. And um, he's, uh, he's, he's the only person I'd feel comfortable recommending you to. So I kind of met them. And in fact, I was uploading the pictures from the amateur show to MD's uh, <laughs> server. Wow. And I was literally sat next to Ronnie and I kind of thought, and I was talking to Brendan and Ronnie and I just thought, I think these guys are on the level. These guys are good. I like what they're saying. They've got integrity. They've got kind of, um, you know, they're honest people. They, they, I think they really want to do something special here. So, and then, well, a year and a half later, I ended up working for them, becoming the RCSS UK market manager. Oh. And uh, me and Rosie had a very, very fun two years. It was a fantastic experience. And it kind of got my faith back, in, instilled back in the supplement industry, which I thought was full of wankers at the time. So that all leads us up to you guys. You and Rosie are putting together a line as we speak, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, we had we came back from uh, a meeting down south <clears throat> yesterday. It was a six hundred mile round trip just to meet the designer. Yeah, so uh, just to meet the designer of um, who's going to be doing the branding. Now, this guy's worked with BMW, Coca Cola, um, but our business partner he said, "Look, Jazz, he says I can see this is going to be a very strong, a very strong brand. It's going to be very unique in terms of its styling because let's face it, Rosie is a very unique style of person and a, a very unique kind of figure, not just in the industry, but who who she is and what she represents. So, um, so yeah, so we had a meeting. It was about an hour and a half, and." Uh, it, very exciting. We've already done the photo shoot when she was dieting for Tampa because we've been planning this since probably February. Um, and we're looking, I was speaking to my partner today and we're looking to launch hopefully for January the first product. But it's also, but the thing is, it's going to be an all female range. This so it's, this supplement, rate, supplement, these are all for women only? Yeah. Wow. What are yeah, they called? So, what's, the, what's the company? Well, it's going to be the Rosie Rascal range. Oh, okay. Rosie Rascal. Yeah, Rosie Rascal, and the Rascal Ray. We, yeah, we, we're, we're sort of, uh, we haven't, you know, it's not completely ironed out, but we've got the kind of the first three products planned. And you see, because obviously, um, I always said I'd never want to get back involved in the, in the industry in manufacturing and kind of producing products yeah. unless we could do something very unique. Because you know what the industry is like, it's, it is kind of very repetitive. Yeah. And, and I can't. I need to be able to get excited about something. And obviously, working with with Rosie, you know, she's my partner. She's she she brings a lot to what. I mean, she brings a lot to the industry. She brings a lot to a lot of personality, a lot of integrity. And I think um, she's a very strong character. And I yeah. think you know, we could uh, if you could have her as a figurehead, I think you'd be doing well as uh, as a business person. So. Yeah, we're well, so excited. I mean, Rosie was buzzing yesterday when we when she sat with the designer. I got I was taking loads of photos, and uh, we were kind of all nodding, going, "This is going to be good," because we're kind of um, we, we've we've kind of got the, the right work ethic. Um, whereas, um, because you know how hard it is to make a dent in the supplement industry. Well, not so, only you have the right work ethic, but you have experience, and you know a lot of things that someone else in that position might not know. So I mm -hmm. think you're in a really good spot to make this a success. But the, part, the partner we've got is someone I've been friends with for nearly 20 years. And I, I, there's not many people in the industry I can say I trust 100%. Yeah. Not just trust in terms of, you know, honesty or whatever, but trusting them to do a good job. He's actually got his own brand, uh, his own supplement brand called Time for Nutrition, which he's only had two years because he, he was a distributor for a big UK company before. And he's very successful and he's very well, very well known, very well thought of. He runs shows um, and he's... Um, he's yeah, yeah, he's he's just. I'm, I could not be going in. We could not be going in with a better person. And I'm very excited. The fact that the three, you know, we we always group message on WhatsApp, and it's like we're all kind of on the same page. And it's just, it you know, I, I've I've kind of succeeded in companies where people haven't been pulling their weight, or you've had someone that hasn't had the kind of same sort of vision or work ethic, and it kind of slows everything down. But when you've got three people that 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 efficient and driven and kind of you know really want to bring something unique and it's like 
we're talking about like raw materials and ingredients and stuff like that and we all want just the best i mean it's you know it's not like oh let's let's put this let's put some um some you know because uh, it looks good on the label but we'll just put a grain in it's like i can't stand that i can't stand that i can't stand that or let's just um let's amino spike or let's just do crap like that i just hate stuff like that i think well, let's amino spike yeah, you know, you might you might get a sort of um, like I said, a lot of these companies, the, the ones that seem to grow fast, they yeah. sort of plummet fast. Sure. So I, I just I'm very excited, and I'm, um, I'm we're looking to go global with it as well because this isn't just a UK brand. I said to I said to Rosie and, and Paul, I said, look, we want, I want this to be you know a big player within a couple of years. I want us to be in supermarkets. I want us to be in you know, and but I want it to actually because Rosie really you know the health she's um, the health and well-being she's very much into you know um, like mental and physical health I mean we've you know we've got a YouTube show and she's very um, you'll see that come across over the next few episodes cool. so you know I could talk to you all day of course uh, <laughs> we I do definitely I want to do one more of these before the end of 2000 what year are we in 17 right 17 <laughs> I want to do like a year-end wrap-up kind of thing and talk about the big stories of the year Big shakeups because there have been a few, huh? Haven't there? So, uh, I'll call this quits for now. I want everyone to make sure they check out the YouTube channel. It's called Tiger and Rascal. What's it called? The, the Tiger and Rascal Show. The Tiger and Rascal Show. Episode <laughs> five just dropped. It's pretty damn cool. They're all cool. Well, yeah. You know, they're, they're not like anything else that's on YouTube in our industry right now. They're <laughs> no. in, in, informative, hilarious, ridiculous, everything you could possibly imagine. He's got. Stormtroopers in there, Darth Vader, you know, Rosie, <laughs> cooking, training, posing, interviews. It's just a, it's a smorgasbord of, of entertainment for your delight. So check out the Tiger and Rascal show on YouTube right now after you, you know, you've watched this already, so it's cool. So I want to thank you, Tiger, for joining you once again, as always. My pleasure. My looking pleasure. forward to the next time we speak, of course. So for the Ron Line Report, this has been Ron Harris with the one and only... Giles Tiger Thomas. <laughs>